is a board game that I don't think is receiving the attention that it deserves. And I think I know why people overlook it. When I first saw Oak, it was last year at Essen, 2022, and when I saw all the little decorations on the workers and I saw the nature-themed gameplay, I had seen enough of that already. So I was quick to judge, but... When I did my five games that are better than Everdell video, when I was researching worker placement games with a nature theme, I took a closer look at Oak and I played it online. And after that, I sent a request to the producer to send me a review copy so I could get to know it even better. And in this way, it just drew me in more and more. <laughs> Oak centers around a mighty oak, and this tree has been there from the beginning of time, and from this tree all of life was born, at least in the religion of these druids. So the tree wants to choose a worthy order to be a leader in the world, and so all of these different orders of druids are competing to be worthy of the tree's choice. Now to do that they're going to be developing spells and telling stories and like harnessing the power of mythical creatures and they're doing all of these things but ultimately this is not a very thematic game it has lovely artwork but at the end of the day this is a worker placement game with uh in which you're trying to build like a resource engine engine because there are point multipliers for certain tasks that you complete during the course of the game uh Playing this game, you are not really thinking about its thematic meaning. You are definitely just thinking about making efficient moves. So it feels like an abstract game, despite the fact that it's, you know, gorgeous. Uh, as far as the artwork is concerned, that is something that I rate when I talk about components. But thematically, this game is like a two. The mechanics of Oak is how the game really shines. And so to describe gameplay to you, I just want to talk about the game concepts, and that's really enough to understand the whole flow of the game. So this is a worker placement game, and players take turns placing their workers until everyone has run out of workers and passed, at which point there's a reset phase and another worker phase, a worker placement phase. So there are five rounds of this in the entire game. So the first big concept of Oak is how this worker placement works. It's actually very different. At the beginning of the game, every player receives nine workers, nine druids, and these druids are split into two types. There are active druids, which go on the player board, and then there are passive druids, which gather around the tree. Three active, six passive. Now, during the action round, players are only going to be using their active druids. So, on a player's turn, they can take one of their active druids and play it on a location on the board, as is the case in most worker placement games. But the thing that really makes this different is that the places on the board don't have any icons for what those places do. They're just spaces. And the actions are actually on corresponding cards in the player's hand. So let's talk about cards really quick. At the beginning of the game, players receive six cards. There are three basic action cards and three advanced action cards, which they can uh, receive during the course of the game. Now, of these three cards, the three cards correspond to the three big spaces around the oak tree. So on a player's turn, they place a worker in one of the areas, and in each area there are three spaces. Each of those spaces corresponds to three actions, on the card. So, when placed, they can perform the corresponding action on the card. Now, the thing about that is that once the card is played, they can't go in that region again. They only have one card for the entire region. This restriction makes the gameplay very interesting because, of course, you're going to want to play multiple actions in the same region of the map, but you can't. You have to prioritize and choose one. Now, the only accommodation you can grant yourself is by uh, using one of the actions that unlocks an advanced action card. Once you have two cards and the advanced ones are a little bit better, or the actions are a little cheaper on the advanced action cards, 
but once you have two, you can play in the same region up to twice, but there's still quite a limit on what you can do. And it really, really uh, makes this problem solving element very interesting. So you've got that, you know, a limited number of workers, a limited number of cards, but then of course there's also competition among players and this is where the passive uh, workers come in. So let's suppose you want to take a space in one of these regions and another player is already there. You can do that but the cost of taking a space where another player is, is that you have to convert one of your active druids into a passive druid, which is essentially like giving up a worker, and that's very costly. Now, of course, there is an action that will let you convert passive druids back into active druids, but when you're performing this, it can, it can really be tough to have to give up that worker. Eventually, you're going to get to a point where you want an action, but it's blocked, and you don't want to pay that cost to take it. At which point, you can play that card instead for the passive ability at the bottom of the card, which allows you to take one of your passive druids and move it up the oak tree. Now, this oak tree has three different paths, and each path terminates with a scoring multiplier that you'll get to apply once you reach the end of that path. Now, the scoring multiplier is a very big deal in scoring, and at each uh, location where the paths terminate, uh, it's locked to only one player, much like Terra Mystica. When you get to the point where you don't want to choose any actions, or just because you've run out of druids, you can use your turn to pass. And when you pass, you can take one of the passive druids at the foot of the tree and take an ingredient uh, in the bottom left corner of the board. And you can keep doing this as long as gameplay continues. So it's your turn, you pass, you take an ingredient, everybody else takes another action, it's your turn again, you pass again, you take another ingredient. As long as you have a druid available and as long as there are ingredients to take, you can just keep taking ingredients while other people do action. As far as what the ingredients do and in making these potions, this is where the replayability of the game really uh, plays out because every game you're going to have a different set of three potions that can be made, but regardless of what gets drawn, they're all very, very interesting. So we talked about this unique mechanic of placing a worker in combination with a card. We talked about active and passive druids and the uh, passing mechanic. The third and final prominent mechanic in Oak that I want to emphasize in this video is the upgradable workers. Upgrading workers is just one of the many actions that you can perform during the game, so briefly, what are those? Most of the actions just use resources to augment your player board. You can add creature cards, artifacts, or structures, all of which are just ways of scoring victory points and providing various upgrades. You can also collect ingredients and prepare potions, but all of these actions are pretty common for a game of this style and not really worth a focus for such a short overview of the game, except for one, the action that lets you upgrade your workers, which is where you put that little decorative element on the individual worker and that specific worker has a special ability for the rest of the game. So these abilities are things like actions are cheaper for a worker or when you take a space where another worker is present you don't have to pay the penalty or a worker who has a free resting area or a worker who expands your player board. Really interesting how that plays into the game but surprisingly it's not the dominant impact on decision making. Most of the time You'll be thinking about how you want to play these cards when you have such strict limitations on the action selection that you can make. So if you can't tell by my enthusiasm, I absolutely love everything about this game's mechanics. They are unique and playing this game for me is all about just engaging with this worker place mechanic. I'm a huge fan of it. For me, mechanics, this game has a 10. So the next element is components, and for components there's really two parts of components. One is how beautiful and high quality the game is, and the other is the functionality of the components. So in terms of the beauty, I, I do think this is an excellent game, it's a very high quality game, and this is actually the standard edition, so the, uh, the upgrades that you put on the workers, they're a good quality plastic, I love the artwork on all of the cards, it's very nice and it plays into the theme. 
that's great. What I really want to focus on, though, is the game's functional uh, strength, because this rule book has a ton of symbols. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and seven page appendix of what all of the symbols do. And now on the back is like a guide. And this guide helps you interpret all of the other symbols. There's so many different things to read. And I'm afraid to say that for many people, it's just gonna be too much. Many people are not going to enjoy how many different symbols are written everywhere in order for you to figure out what to do. I usually begin my preparation for this game, and I'm actually putting it in front of people, by giving them photocopies that I've made of the symbol guide and saying like, listen, the hardest thing about this game is going to be interpreting so many symbols. Now, while that's hard, they still did an excellent job. When you become familiar with the conventions that they use, the symbols are very easy to read. And the designer deserves credit for making well-designed components that are easy to read. I would rate this game highly, probably like an eight for components. I would just caution you that uh, you would very easily be turned off to this game because of how overwhelming it is. So for strategy, you can probably already tell this is a very strategic game. I did want to throw in one more detail about it though, and that is one of the things that I find so enjoyable is that regardless of what happens in this game, you can usually find a way to make a comeback. And that's what makes the game so interesting. Like some games, you know, a player can kind of be really aggressive by taking an action that they know that you needed. And, and it can kind of ruin your game, right? In Oak, every time I've played, even when players block my space, because there are so many options on those action cards, you, you really can find a, a, another alternative there. And so I think I find so enjoyable is like, okay, well, this isn't going well, but I bet, you know, what if I did, what if I did this? Oh my gosh, and then that would work. That And you can go down this whole path of like an alternate strategy for what you were doing before. And that's very, very rewarding. I don't get frustrated playing this game where it's like, oh, you know, you blocked the thing that I wanted. Ah. Instead, it's like, okay, all right, that didn't work out, but I can find something else here. Let's see. And when you find that like additional strategy, I love that feeling. So um, I would say that that probably give a game like a nine for strategy. And then for complexity, unless you're, you know, skipping through this video and you missed the part about components, all of the complexity in this game is on how many different things there are to consider. Also, something that is very, uh, you know, you see very often like Stegmaier games are objectives that you can give a player and it's like, here, your goal is to do this very simple thing objectives given to players at the beginning of the game provide a lot of guidance on what they should focus on and very helpful when players are new to the game. This game has no such objectives. It is a completely open playground. You can do whatever you want and you don't have to balance out everything. You can play, I, I've played this game and decided not to get any artifacts. And I've played this game and decided not to do any potions. Like you can do that. You can just focus on your one thing and then shoot up that oak tree to make sure that you're the one who gets the multiplier for the strategy that you've selected. But it is all up to the players. They get no guides at all. So when you have that much freedom and then there are so many symbols, it can be completely overwhelming. But that being said, it's not complicated. It's not a complicated game, it's just that for someone who's new to the game, reading all of those uh, symbols is a bit much. So for complexity, probably like a six. So that is the game Oak. I have played this game several times already. It has been popular with my group and my group of friends plays a lot of different board games, which I think makes it very easy for everybody to adapt to that pretty overwhelming set of symbols. It's just that the worker placement mechanic in this game is just thoroughly satisfying. It's the one feature that everyone has commented on. That is why I recommend the game. It's certainly why I think the game deserves more attention. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you found it helpful. Uh, I will see you next time.
Bye-bye.